afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Entrepreneurs this morning. Today it's my pleasure to uh, bring a, uh, a banker who is very qualified and uh, his name is Robert Bowen. He's been in banking for 35 years. Seems longer. But... <laughs> and um, he, uh, he runs uh, what's considered uh, by the uh, uh, people that, uh, that uh, great banks are the best bank in uh, the state. And it's uh, Brighton Bank. And Rob is the president. And uh, he's going to talk to you a little bit about how banking works and some opportunities that could be available uh, for people that uh, want to go into banking. So, without any uh, further introduction, I'm going to turn the time over to Robert Bowler. I am a banker. Uh, I am heartless without personality. So, um, so that's just part of the business. Um, but uh, I wanted, I appreciate this opportunity to come and speak. Uh, banking is, a, is an interesting business over the past five years with, with the uh, economic downturn, with the, the Great Recession. It's been a challenge uh, and, and we've seen a lot of consolidation over the last few years. We've seen a lot of, of banks uh, go out of business or be, be closed by the FDIC. So. It has been a challenging time, and uh, the industry will change uh, in the future. And so it's, it's always evolving, and there will be a lot of, uh, of changes coming up. But what I thought we'd do today is talk a little bit about uh, banking, banking structure, and this could be the most boring presentation you've ever seen. Uh, so if you start to nod off, uh, you know, I... I okay. Well, well, I do have a pretty good arm. I can throw things. Uh, but uh, if you do nod off, just don't snore too loudly. Uh, I'll, I'll try and speak up. But uh, let's go to the, the first slide. Uh, as we talk about different types of financial institutions, if you go back and look at the history of banking, I, nobody really knows when it started uh, or how it started. There are some, some legends, some stories that, that go back to the days when uh, there were guilds and, and craftsmen that uh, uh, operated, that was basically the, the source of, of uh, the economy. And it goes back to the time when there were goldsmiths and they were dealing with a very precious commodity. Uh, they were taking gold and, and um, crafting different products out of that for sale. And so they had to develop a method to keep their, their products safe and protected. So, they, they had intricate ways of, of storing their gold so it couldn't be stolen, couldn't be taken. And people began to realize that that might not be a bad place uh, to put your valuables. And so other people would bring gold into this goldsmith and say, would you hold this for me and keep it? And uh, the goldsmith, being fairly bright, started to realize that he was storing more gold than he ever needed to use. And so he decided that I can, you know, I can take some of this gold that people have brought in and give it to other people that may need it to, you know, buy other products, to start other businesses, to do something else with it. Um, and then I can charge them a small fee for that. Uh, and, and banking is always just a reasonable fee, nothing exorbitant. But, uh, and so it developed that he would always have excess gold would be able to lend that out to other people for their use. They would bring it back, pay him interest, and, and everything was fine. The trouble came about when he didn't get his gold back and somebody wanted to, needed to come in and take their, their own gold and, and do whatever they needed to do with it. So thus the, the regulation of banking was developed. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about more, a little bit more about that later. But as of today, the, the evolution of banking has, uh, has developed into uh, quite a, different, a number of different types of entities. Uh, there are national banks. Those would be the Chase Manhattans, the, the Wells Fargo's, the, uh, you know, those large multi-billion dollar banks. 
regional banks, uh, the Zions Bank is a good example. In multi-states in a certain region of the country uh, and, and serve that, that part of the country. Uh, community banks like mine, uh, typically much smaller. Uh, community banks are usually categorized as those banks that are under $10 billion in total assets. You know, my bank is just a little blip of that. We're about $180 million total assets. So, you know, very, very small in comparison with some of these others that are a trillion dollars in assets. Uh, but they focus mainly on a single community, a single group of people. Uh, credit unions, uh, financial institutions that are developed by uh, a group of people that have a common interest. Um, the uh, military uh, forms a credit union. Uh, Utah Power and Light has a credit union. Uh, the Congress has their own credit union. Uh, those are developed for people that have a, special, a certain interest uh, and were developed for really low to moderate income families uh, to consolidate their funds and, and help each other uh, purchase cars, homes, uh, etc. Um, and we won't talk about the taxation issue, or that may take up the rest of the hour. So, uh, industrial loan corporations; those are uh, a relatively unique group of, of organizations. Those uh, are companies such as Target, uh, BMW, Pitney Bowles. Uh, Utah has some very unique laws which allow companies to form their own banking institutions and fund the, the sale of their own products. And Utah, is a, Utah and Nevada are probably the, the two largest states, or the two states that have the largest concentration of ILCs. Uh, very unique, very specific, uh, and they really don't compete with, with local banks directly. They have a specific mission and usually fund their own business model. And then there are other institutions, uh, check cashing companies, those kinds of things. Um, any questions on those? Does that make sense? Okay, Rick, let's go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, just quickly, we'll go through this very, these very quickly. Just wanted to uh, kind of show how the, the banking industry has, has changed over the last few years, over the last 13 years. If you look at uh, uh, the top 10 banks, uh, if you look at from 2000 to 2013, this is going through the recession that we've just been through, and some would say we're not quite out of yet. But from a deposit standpoint, uh, the largest ten, top 10 banks hold about 50% of the total assets, or total deposits, of, uh, of the country. Uh, banks uh, greater than $10 billion, about 19%. Smaller banks like mine, about 10%. But you look at, at how they've, the changes over the years, uh, the top 10 banks, they have accumulated deposits, grown substantially, while the other institutions have, have, uh, have reduced in total deposits. Okay, Rick, next slide. Uh, loans, very similar. Uh, you're seeing uh, some of the larger banks, because of technology, because of some of the things that they can do, uh, they have grown substantially in, in loan totals. Uh, the smaller banks, we're all struggling for loans. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, of, of why uh, loans are so important to, the, uh, to a bank. They really are the lifeblood of a bank. Okay, next slide. Uh, let's just talk about the banking basics. What do we do? You know, what ha what's, what's our line of business? Um, first of all, we provide security. Uh, we keep money safe and we make it available on demand uh, for those that, that need it. Um, we become a payment intermediary. We provide checking, uh, debit credit cards. Uh, we provide letters of credit and we'll talk about that a little bit later, what those are. Uh, we provide investment vehicles, uh, and, and right now with the rates where they are, this isn't the greatest uh, source for investment return, but we do provide savings accounts, we provide CDs, and there are other types of investments that some banks offer. Uh, 
but the most important thing that we do is we replace cash shortfalls. Um, we provide credit for businesses and we provide credit for individuals. Uh, you need to borrow when you don't have enough cash to buy something. Uh, a business has to do the same thing. If, they're out, if they don't have uh, cash to pay for everything, they need to borrow. They need to replace that gap, that shortfall. And that's what banks do. So, so as we provide security, we talked before about the, the goldsmith. Uh, it is important that the banking community, the banking industry, is considered safe and sound. Uh, during the depression of 29, when the banking industry essentially collapsed, uh, the government stepped in, formed the FDIC uh, to ensure those deposits, to make sure that people that put money into a bank could rely upon uh, those funds to be available when they needed them. So FDIC stepped in, provides that insurance coverage. During this last recession, I'm not sure if you knew that or this or not, but uh, insurance coverage was increased from $250,000 up to an unlimited amount in transaction accounts, and checking accounts. So if you had a million dollars in your checking account, it was 100% insured. Uh, that came off last year, back down to the $250,000 level. Was that just the community banks? That was everybody. That was all banks. Uh, so the FDIC opened that up for everyone. Um, so now it's back to 250. Now it's back to 250. Uh, it was increased. What was it? About 10, 15 years ago, from 100,000 to 250. Because we have that insurance, the government feels like they need to make sure that banks are are run in a safe and sound manner. And so we are very highly regulated. I think of any other uh, industry in the country, I don't know of any that are, are more regulated than we are. Uh, during the, the last depression, the Dodd-Frank Act was passed. It is about 2,500 pages of law, but when that gets converted to regulation, it becomes about 25 to 27,000 pages of regulation. And after four years of implementation, they're about halfway through. So, uh, you know, I was back in Washington uh, last October and met with all the regulators, and uh, you know, they're still trying to figure out what that, what the Dodd Frank law is. Uh, and so, we expect to have much more regulation uh, applied to the the banking industry. Uh, we're also very uh, highly examined. Uh, regulators come in generally every 18 months and go through all of our books, they go through all of our assets, our asset quality, and determine whether or not we're safe or sound. If, if a bank is considered to be risky, then they will put additional regulations and restrictions on how you operate. So uh, there, there is a much, there is a lot of scrutiny uh, over the banking industry. Is that per Per bank, or per, do they just do regulations just for your own that you're running that you need to come up to these standards or whatever? Yeah, they, they, that to everyone? yeah they set standards that everybody has to meet, uh, at least minimum standards. Um, they've come up with uh, the Basel III, which is a capital restriction or capital requirement standard that goes into effect, well, it went into effect in January for the larger banks, for the smaller banks under $10 billion, it goes into effect next January, uh, which provides some very stringent capital requirements um, for, for specific banks. But everybody should be under the same structure, the same guidelines. Uh, but there, there are some flexibility that they provide for us. Um, they, they restrict the types of assets we can acquire. Uh, we can't do certain types of loans, we can't buy certain types of, of securities, and so they want to make sure that assets that we have are liquid. Uh, like we talked about, there are capital requirements uh, and maintain minimum capital levels, and we have to maintain certain liquidity levels. Okay, now you can go. Uh, we facilitate payments. Uh, you know, we provide ready access to cash. ATMs, branches are available, you can step in and, and 
and receive cash for what you have in, uh, in your accounts. Uh, we issue checks uh, so you can draw upon those funds at any time. Uh, provide electronic transfers bank to bank. Uh, we can send a wire for you to, to another bank if you need to make a payment uh, or uh, facilitate some transaction. Uh, we provide merchant exchange, debits and credit cards that merchants use, that you use when you buy something at a, um, at a store. Uh, we provide those credit facilities. And then we become a risk intermediary uh, with a letter of credit. If, if you were an exporter and were buying a product in China, where you're having something manufactured in China, and you want that shipped back to you, and then you want to make a payment, you don't want to give them a payment before you get your product back. And so you want to have somebody in the middle that will help facilitate that transaction. And so banks will issue letters of credit, uh, a documentary letter of credit, which provides a vehicle for, for trade and exchange. So you will send, the bank will send a letter of credit to the manufacturer that says, under these conditions, the bank will send you a check or will wire your funds. And then uh, those conditions are typically a, a draft for the amount of the invoice, a copy of the invoice, and a copy of, of or the, the original bill of lading. Um, and the bill of lading is, is the instrument that gives title to the product. So when the product is ready to ship, the manufacturer will package all of those documents together, send those to the bank, the bank will review them, and then they will send a payment to the manufacturer. Then you, as the owner of that product, will take those documents, take those to Long Beach or Seattle or, or Oakland or wherever you pick up your product, and give them the bill of lading, pick up your goods, and you're good to go. So the bank provides that service and that function for uh, a lot of merchants and a lot of uh, import-export business. Okay. Uh, Investment vehicles, we've talked savings accounts, certificates of deposit, insurance, annuities. Uh, you know, right now we're paying on a savings account about, and I'm really embarrassed to say this, but we pay about 0.01%. Um, and the reason being is the money that we invest with the Federal Reserve, we only get 0.25%. Uh, and we have to pay FDIC insurance, which is about 0.15%, so very, very thin margins. So um, banks need your deposits, but they're not going to pay you anything for them uh, yet. As soon as uh, interest rates rise, then, then that might change. Okay. Uh, all right. This is probably the biggest thing that banks do. The most important thing that banks do is we replace cash shortfalls. And you know, simple economics, there are two sources of cash. Uh, one is equity, and the other is debt. You know, equity is what you have, cash you have in the bank. It's cash that you have in your back pocket, in your mattress. It's the money that you've saved. Okay, that's, that's your equity. So if you go to buy a house, you will have to put in, make a down payment. You'll have to put in uh, a certain amount of equity money that you've saved uh, to buy that home. You'll need to borrow to get the rest of that. Um, you know, unless you're like Rick and he can pay cash for everything. So next one. Um, okay, equity comes from two sources. And this is it, the same thing as if you're a small business uh, or starting a business, um, you will have to have some level of equity. Uh, and that's going to come from capital injections. Uh, again, that's from your savings. That's from your mom and dad. That's from your next door neighbor. That's from you know, a good friend that's willing to go into that business with you and provide that cash, provide that equity. Um, or it can come from retained earnings. It comes from the earnings of that company that you don't pull out and spend. It's what you keep in that company and reinvest. Okay. Really, aren't any other sources of equity that you can come up with? Okay, let's go to debt. Um, 
Okay, debt will come from trade credits. That's from your receivables or your payables. Um, it comes from uh, your accruals, but primarily your payables. Uh, your supplier will send you product for your inventory and uh, you have 30 days, 45 days to pay them. Okay, that's a source of cash for you. Uh, you know, you've been through your business classes, you know, that becomes a source of cash, that account's payable. Okay, so trade credit becomes a source of, of debt that helps you fund your business or helps you fund whatever activity you're doing. Uh, institutional credit comes from a bank. Okay, that's the, the money you come in and say, okay, banker, I need uh, money for working capital. I need money to buy a building. I need money to buy more inventory. Uh, I have X amount that I can put in of my own, but I need to borrow that, that difference. Okay, so the bank will provide that credit. Uh, third party investors, again, those are your parents, your neighbors, your acquaintances, those other people that have cash that would be willing to lend you that money uh, on, on certain terms, okay? There are, and I have another slide that we, that we will get to, but, uh, or maybe, we don't have to get there, but banks have, have costs. Uh, we have to pay our depositors, and right now we don't have to pay them very much, but we do have to pay depositors, we have to pay for our overhead, uh, we have to pay FDIC insurance. Uh, we have to pay state uh, assessments uh, for state regulation. Um, we have to pay rent on our buildings, uh, utilities. Uh, the largest cost is, uh, is we have to pay uh, our employees. You know, my exorbitant salary comes out of that. Um, but then we also have to provide a return on our investment. We have to provide a return to our shareholders. Or we would not have people that are willing to invest their money with us. So uh, all of that, just like another, any other business, uh, you know, that interest rate is the markup that we charge on the product that we sell. Um, if you sell uh, hamburgers at McDonald's, you know, their cost is going to be X and their price is going to be Y and that difference is going to be their profit. And the interest rate is basically the profit margin that the bank has to charge. Um, okay, other questions? Is that, okay. Okay, so as we look at um, kind of the composition of the bank, our asset structure, we're, you know, a lot like any business, but our asset structure is we have cash. And we, that's uh, basically excess deposits that we have. Investments, uh, that's one of the vehicles where we put that cash to earn, earn uh, uh, income. Uh, we have our loans and then we have our non-earning assets. These would be our buildings, uh, facilities, uh, equipment, those kinds of things. Uh, liabilities. Uh, accruals and payables, those are a very small part. The major liability that a bank has is our deposits. Um, if you look at banks, they are probably the highest leveraged company or business that you'll see anywhere in the market. Uh, we have very small levels of capital. If you look at a chase, you know, their capital to their total assets is going to be less than 6%. It's probably in the 4% range. A very healthy bank will have something in the 10 to 12% range, which doesn't give us a lot of, give you a lot of cushion to make any mistakes. Uh, usually that equity is, is what you, if you make a mistake and have a loss, that's where you cover the loss is out of your equity, out of your capital. Uh, banks don't have a lot of that, okay? So they have to be very, very careful on how they uh, purchase their assets. 
Uh, right now in the marketplace, most banks are very liquid. Uh, they have more cash than they need. Uh, our bank is, uh, you know, we're, we're in a position where we have about 50% of all of our assets in cash or investments. Investments would be uh, government-backed bonds, would be very uh, safe, secure investments. Uh, Mortgage-backed securities that are backed by uh, um, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Jenny Mae. Uh, so we have a lot in cash. We have about half of our assets in loans. Uh, typically what we want to see is you want to put about 80% of your assets in loans, which are earning assets. Uh, and you want to leave uh, you know, cash enough to be liquid so people, when they need to get their money back, will have some there. But uh, uh, you want to keep most of your assets in, in loans where you can earn, earn a return. And then, you know, like I say, our capital is made up of, of our initial stock investment and then what we've retained over the years, okay? Uh, our bank, we have uh, a capital ratio of about 12%. Um, under the Basel III requirements, it, has, it will be about 8% is the minimum requirement. If you look at other types of capital measurements, um, that 8% is the minimum, ours is about 25%. So, uh, you know, we're very, very well capitalized, and part of that is because we're, we're so liquid, so. Um, yeah, these will just drive you nuts if I go through all of these. So, you know, these are, these are ratios that the regulators are going to be looking at. These are what they review and how they grade a bank. You know, they look at capital, our core capital, our uh, risk-based capital, um, profitability, return on assets, return on equity, um, loan quality. Uh, uh, Texas ratio is a, is a ratio that's become very active over the last few years. Uh, a Texas ratio of 100 means that uh, your bank is, is a high probability of failure. Uh, the lower number, the better. Uh, Right now, our bank has a Texas ratio of zero, um, which is great. We probably should be higher than that, but uh, we need to make some more bad loans. But, um, well, you said you guys aren't lending very much, right? Most of your stuff's you know, we would, we would love to lend. The problem is there just aren't that many opportunities. Um, you know, the, the market has not rebounded quickly enough to give us a lot of good, solid lending opportunities. So, and everybody is after the same thing. Everybody's liquid. Okay. So, um, I'm just going to grab this. Reggie, in your comment on uh, why are loans so expensive at covering uh, those costs, and what you have to look at is not so much what uh, the cost of that loan is, is, uh, is what you would want to return on your money as capital and compare that. If you get a 20% return on your money and you're paying 6% for a loan, then that gives you an additional 14% earning capacity on that, uh, on that money that you have. And it can provide you the ability to expand your business. So as entrepreneurs, those are the kinds of things you want to look at. What, uh, Sam, what is my cost in this? And what, uh, how can I benefit from uh, getting cheaper money than, than my money? Because I expect to make 20% on it. Or if I'm Reggie, I probably want 50%, don't you, Reggie, on your money? <laughs> so these are the kinds of things that you have to take into consideration when you talk about the cost of borrowing money. And I do believe it's still tax deductible, isn't it? The interest you pay, so. Some of it, ahead, some of Sam. it. Um, I have a question, like how do you, uh, you know like the competition between like national banks and community banks, like how do like, um, how do you like the community bank like um, survive? Because like it's hard to survive when you have like a national banks, you know, like nationwide, and we have the community bank. 
how do you like, survive in like business like you know? Good question. Um, it's tough. It's difficult. We compete. Um, well, like Reggie says, uh, everybody is concerned about price. Uh, if we, if you look back before you guys were even born, uh, back when I started in the banking industry, prime rate um, was at about uh, 20, 20, 21 percent. I think it was 21 percent. And so we were making loans at 23 to 24 percent. Uh, when I bought my first home, uh, my loan was 10% and it was an adjustable rate. Uh, the month after I closed the rates, the mortgage rates went up to 16%. So if you look at the markets now, you know, we're charging 3, 4, 5% on a loan. Uh, home loans are running about 4 to 4.5%. You know, so in relative terms, money is very cheap. And uh, if you look at a cost of capital, your highest cost of capital is going to be that investor that steps in and wants a 20% return on his money, you know, to put stock in and take that risk. Uh, the bank is going to be probably your, one of your lowest costs of capital. Uh, and right now it is extremely low. Talking about how we compete, uh, we go head to head with, with uh, national banks all the time. Uh, the difficulty is, is they have sophisticated facilities where they can hedge some of their interest rate products, uh, which allow them to put a, a fixed rate, lo very low interest rate product out on a, say if they're financing an office building. Uh, I've seen some rates as low as three, seven, three, three and three quarters percent uh, for a 25 year term. I can't do that. Uh, if, if rates go up tomorrow and I have my money lo loaned out at three and a quarter percent or three and three quarters percent, you know, I'm underwater in a matter of months. So uh, the only way I can compete is I provide uh, a service where I can be a little bit more nimble. You know, if somebody needs money tomorrow, I can do that because I, I make that decision. Uh, I don't have to go to a committee, a loan committee. Uh, you know, when I worked at a national bank, my loan committee was in Minneapolis. And so I'd have to prepare a presentation, send it to Portland for review. Well, I sent it to Boise for review. They'd send it to Portland, and then they'd send it to Minneapolis. Uh, now, they bring it to me, we look at it, and we approve it. Or decline it, but we approve, we approve most everything. The other thing, Sam, is that you, uh, when you talk about relationships, because when you go to Chase, you may have a loan officer that you've set up an association with and you have a line of credit. And one uh, Monday afternoon you go in there with a need and he's been moved to uh, California. Where in the community bank, um, a lot of times those bankers have been there uh, 35, 40 years, and, they, um, and they're there, and you can go in. And when he talks about, uh, that's, that's the relationship banking. That's the advantage of a, of a community bank and having that. And I think that uh, Rob and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but what you would want, uh, if you're a smart businessman, is you would want a local relationship for some of your needs, and you'd also want a national bank. You want to have relationships with both, for um, because you're looking out for your business. Would that be an adequate statement? No, absolutely. Um, you know, lending money is is based on trust. Uh, you know, we have to. You know, we look at the fundamentals. We look at the fun fundamentals of financial statements and your ability to repay, but. The, one of the primary factors is that trust, is that relationship that we have with the borrower. Uh, if we've done business with you for a number of years, then you know, we have a little bit of latitude uh, where we can make, uh, make some exceptions. Um, so it, if, you know, if I have any suggestions for you as, as young entrepreneurs or as business people, it's, 
it's get to know your banker. Um, one of the one of the problems nowadays is is with with the electronics and with the technology that people aren't coming into banks any longer. Uh, you know, they make their deposits with their phone. They they transfer money with their phone. They make payments with their online banking product, and and they don't know who their banker is. Um, you know, you have to know who your dentist is. You have to know who your doctor is, and a banker for a business person or an individual provides a very, very important service uh, to help you with your, financial, uh, with your financial goals. So it's that relationship, and that's, I think that's, the re that's the way we can compete, is on a relationship. And we can't offer everything to everybody. We have to provide a very niche product. And so, you know, we specialize in, in certain products, and we try and do those better than anybody else. Um, so, other questions? Yes. Oh. I just want to know when the, when the new chips come in for our debit cards or even our credit cards because I know it's you know the Target has to with the, the stolen identities. It's a good question. Um, I was reading an article just the other day. Uh, the Target had that chip availability and was putting those on their cards about 10 years ago. But it wasn't accepted by the rest of the, of the community. So you have to have a specific reader for those chips. Your ATMs have to be retrofitted to accept those chips. And, and the cost of that just hasn't caught up with, uh, with the demand, demand yet. So it will come eventually. Uh, and it's it's needed. Uh, Europe has it already, but uh, it's just we haven't, as a as a society, been willing to spend the money to, to implement it yet. So, Melissa, you we were talking about letters of credit. Um, what happens if they get you know the paperwork and everything, and they give it to you, but some of the product comes back damaged when they receive it? Would that go through you? Would that go through them? No, that has to, that goes through them directly. Uh, the banks just handle the primary shipment and, and that transfer. So. So you would pay them even though it's damaged, and then you have to work it. Yeah, out. I don't. I I never see the product. I only deal with the paperwork, and and so they uh, they may have some stipulations that they review, and that may be part of the letter of credit if they've had experience that they get damaged product. They'll add that to the letter of credit, and uh, and so they ha they have the ability to inspect, and they may have inspectors at the port that will inspect before we get the documents. So, yeah, so they've figured that out. So. Yes. So Chase has come out with a um, thing with their uh, cash deposits, where um, if you're not on an account you can't uh, deposit cash into somebody else's account. Is that something that you guys think you'll catch on to? I, I don't think it's like from FDIC or anything like that. I just think that's something that they're implementing for money laundering to try mm -hmm. to take it down. Do you think that's uh, something you guys will jump on that? Yeah, I mean, we do that now. Do I mean, we don't allow people to put money in other people's accounts. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, banking is, is risk management. Right. Um, you know, there, there is no other, I don't think, know of any other industry that sells a product and expects to get it back. You know, you know, that's our business. We sell a product, which is money, but you have to give it back to us, okay, with a fee. Uh, nobody else does that, I don't, that I know of. Um, so, in order to get that back, we have to mitigate those risks somehow. So, you know, we'll mitigate that with collateral, uh, with a, a very extensive credit analysis to make sure that there's an ability to repay. But there are also other risks. There are operational risks. And, and that's, this is an operational risk for fraud and for money laundering. Um, you know, side note, political statement, you know, the government has put the onus on the banking industry to uh, do their regulation for them, or do their, their enforcement for them. Um, you know, we are under very, very strict guidelines and 
monetary penalties if we allow money laundering. Uh, if, if we have money laundering going through the bank, we don't catch that, uh, they can put uh, a monetary damages on the bank and, and charge us for that. Um, new regulations are coming into effect that if an auto dealer is uh, not following um, equal credit guidelines and the bank finances that paper, then the bank is liable for that. They're making us enforce auto dealers to make sure that they're providing equal credit. You know, so we become the enforcement agencies. So you're, you're saying money launder. All right, you know, like, you know how some states they legalize marijuana and everything? Uh-huh. So like, what if a, there's a business that's operating, they have license and everything to run the business and they just want to deposit the money they made um, from the profit or whatever they sold? into a bank. Is that considered money laundering because it's not legal in every state? Or I heard that that's a good question. Is that, yeah. I seen, is I that your new business? Is that they came they came out and said yeah. banks can't accept this. Yeah, I, I think they're making some exceptions. Yeah. Because people people had safe rooms and they had to hire like armed security twenty four seven and it wasn't yeah. good so the federal government came out and and said we we want the banks to accept this. Yeah, I, they they'll adapt to that. I mean, if it's if it's legal, you know, they'll figure out a way for the banks to participate. But, yes. Um, okay, so other countries have completely removed currency altogether, and like they all do things plastic or like use their phones as like for for essentially for exchange. Is that something that could happen in America? Is that something the banks are pushing for? How do how is that it, you know, by the industry? It's becoming more and more uh, uh, acceptable. Um, you know, as technology advances, you know, I could see that happening. It really won't change the function of the banks much. Right. It's just a, a different form of, of transaction. You know, so you know, banks will adapt. They'll have to uh, you know, provide those facilities. We just won't have to hold so much cash in our vaults. Uh, you know, it might reduce the exposure of uh, bank robberies. Uh, by the way, if you're going to rob a bank, that's not, probably not a great <laughs> idea. It's, uh, y you know, most robberies that we've had, uh, the most they've ever been able to get away with is about $1,000. You know, and that's not worth five to 10 to 15 years in jail. Uh, you know, so, you know, there are better ways to make money. So. Plus the dye pack is uh, not very flattering when you get that orange explosion. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it orange, not blue? It's, it's, it's red. red, yeah. It's red, yes. Yeah, we actually, we had a robbery a couple of weeks, a months ago, and you know, these guys weren't bright. Um, <laughs> they, they, they were robbing a bank. How bright could they well, be? Well, yeah, but they were even worse than that. They, they came in a taxi. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, they, 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 came with it, they came in a taxi and uh, took the dye pack, and he went to jump in the taxi, and the dye pack exploded in on him. In the taxi? And, in the taxi, so he took off. I'm sure but, the taxi yeah, he wasn't real thrilled. But, um, Guess their getaway driver was sick. <laughs> I we're coming, don't know. Um, we're coming to the uh, to the close, but as entrepreneurs, a couple of things that uh, Rob pointed out and uh, that you pick up is that uh, you can, even though there's a cost of money, you can make money on that money, which uh, gives you what they call leverage. The other thing is that as you um, as you do business and you uh, get to know the banker, that's important. But also, the third thing is it's also very important that you keep your end of the obligation. And when you borrow, be sure to pay it back. Because if you pay it back, what can you do? You can go borrow it again or borrow more as you as you build a uh, credit relationship with that banker. So it's to your benefit to have a good banking relationship. And again, recommending that, yeah, there's, there's advantages to having a national bank, but there's also advantages to being tied into a community bank 
where people know you and can act quickly uh, when an emergency occurs. But again, that is, you're, it's dependent on you having a, a good credit history with them, okay? With us, if you're starting a small business, would it be wiser to choose a community bank that's also invested in the community that you're trying to create the business in? I'm a little biased, but I'd say yes. <laughs> um, I would, it's a no. <laughs> and I would second that, Melissa. Yeah, that's It would be uh, definitely easier to create that relationship, yeah. I would think. Yeah. yeah. But you also have to look at cost. Like we said, they can only go so low. And when you start a business is when you usually fail one because of money. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as you start a business, a couple of things to keep in mind, like, like Rick said, uh, or is it mm -hmm. Professor Lambert, I'm sorry. I, no, Rick's fine. Okay, Rick is fine. <laughs> um, you need to make sure that your credit history is pretty solid. I mean, like we talked before, it's, banking's a trust industry, it's a trust business. And we look, we look at past history is probably key. I mean, that's one of the most important things we look at. So, you know, make sure that your credit is clean. You, you have a good history of paying bills back, not only to the bank, but to other people, that you're always current. Um, you need to consider collateral. You know, the bank has to rely on something for repayment. Um, uh, you look at the amount that you have to put in as a down payment or as your own equity. You know, banks will typically not lend you 100% of any project or any endeavor. You have to have some equity of your own. Um, you know, always more is better, but uh, sometimes that's limited. And so there are other ways to, to finance things. I mean, you can go through SBA guarantees. Uh, banks use that to help offset some of that risk and mitigate some of that risk of uh, you know, less equity or, or uh, 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 being a new business. So, uh, so there, are, there are ways to do it. Um, but just, just ask. I mean, don't be afraid to, to ask your banker, how do I get this done? Because uh, right now, banks want to lend money. And, just and tell you what you don't have and what you need. Yeah, and they'll figure out a way. They'll tell you what they need to have to make it work mm -hmm. uh, and, and what you need to do to get to where you need to be. So, yeah. Now, Rob, did you have some of these gold bars? Are you going to hand those out? Or <laughs> Please? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> very small ones. No, no actually, oh, these oh. are... <laughs> no, actually, I have uh, just some little... Uh, tape measures. Um, that's all I had. I, I'd, I'd bring golf balls, but we're a little early in the season for that. But. You could have thrown that sleeping student. Yeah, that's a possibility. So. Well, I do. I appreciate uh, your, your listening and, and paying attention and staying awake. So thank you very much.